Welcome, friends, to episode 229 of Color of Magic, your Magic Gaming Podcast, where we talk about all types of stuff that affects players at and away from their gaming tables and computers. I am your host, Power Dragon, and with me, hopefully not feeling like I do after being worn out this weekend, my main man, Brian Sionic. How's it going, man? No, I, I feel pretty good. Ready to... I'll, I'll be... Uh, I'll be as tired as you are here in about a week after WWE 2K launches. And oh yeah, that's around the corner, right? March uh, March fifth. Uh, f- yeah, I think eighth is regular release, and fifth is if you do the pre order. Of course, I'm doing the pre order because I want to see all the new stuff. I got to say, for all the podcast listeners, if y'all y'all are a little late. If you'd have got me two days ago, I sounded like old Big Luther. <laughs> like you, with, let's get it on. Like we could have we could have done some stuff. Like. We're past that, though. But yeah, no joke, dude. I think I talked to like 2,000 people this weekend. It felt like it. It might only been like a little over 1,000, but my God, it felt like a ton. Yeah. It was just constant all weekend. It was crazy. But that left me with a little bit of a scratchy voice. So I'm going to hopefully not be coughing a lot in your ear and everything else this episode while we get through it. But, man, we have a lot to cover. There was a crazy deck that won a big tournament there. Uh, kind of blew everybody's mind. We've got some issues with Card Kingdom that came up last week while I was gone. And uh, just stuff about the general convention setups for tournaments. So, yeah, we're going to cover a lot of things here. But before we get everything, don't forget to check out our sponsor over at CoolStuffInc.com. Use code DRAGON. Save yourself 5% because saving money is awesome. And you help us out. Also, if you want to support the show, go to patreon.com slash color magic and you can get a shout out just like Dennis Trinkle. Thank you so much for being a patron. And as always, you can go to color of mtg.com slash shop and get some little goodies for yourself. All right. That brings us to our lead story that I was just talking about. But dude, for those who don't know, there was a standard tournament with a $75,000 prize at Chicago, well, Magic, Magic Con Chicago. And this was like the first big standard tournament we've had in a while. And people weren't sure how well received it was going to be, but it was over 500 players. And I believe it was like $100 or something to play. So like people showed out to play this thing. And then what was crazy is it was won by a deck that was a 68 card deck. And their record on the weekend, I believe, was 12 1 and 1. So it wasn't like they got lucky. You know, they went through all the different metagame decks, but somehow a 68 card deck managed to get it done and win $15,000 because that's that's what the first prize was. Now, the crazy thing about the deck is that it uses the new Nissa, it uses Slogurk. So, like, you're trying to get your lands back out of the graveyard, trigger Nissa to get extra mana, and then you could either just attack with a couple of your creatures that you've grown, or you can try to, like, long term combo and keep getting Jace out of the graveyard and then mill your opponent out. So it's really kind of an interesting deck, almost a little complicated to play, to be honest. I gave it a go uh, in a video by the time this goes out a couple of days ago. But I don't know, man. What do you think about this? Like, it feels like it turned everything on its side. And now people are wondering, like, okay, should we play more than 60? Yeah, after I I feel like the answer to that is probably no, unless you have a a plan like this. And I'm not not even sure this deck requires it, but I but clearly they knew what they were doing. They went 12, one and one. Yeah, when when I was done playing it, I felt like I could easily get it down to 64 cards. After that, it got kind of tight. Like, do I just want to move a couple of lands? Because it plays like 36 lands, I believe. Yeah, after I heard it explained, I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to try this. I will outsmart myself (laughs) at every turn trying to do this. Yeah, it was it was crazy. And I've talked to a couple of players and they said, you know, even people didn't make day two. They said they played against seven different decks in seven rounds on the first day. And I was like, okay, that's a good sign. Right. When people are saying like, oh, standard, everybody's playing the same thing or whatever. Obviously, they're not. You know, when people are playing, I mean, that was an outlier to play seven different decks, but I did talk to multiple people that said at least five different types of decks, which is pretty cool. And you have the winner being a deck that's completely off the reservation completely. You know what I mean? Like this is, this is in a whole other world all by itself, built a whole different way, playing way too many lands, playing way too many cards. And somehow it still took first place. I don't, think, I don't think we can stay off the reservation anymore. Maybe like. we shouldn't be saying that. Yeah, That's I don't a good think call. We can say that one anymore. I'll I'll have to work on that one. 
<laughs> for sure. But yeah, it's, it's a it's an interesting thing because I'm with you. I don't think we should still be playing more than 60 cards, right? I don't think that's what, what this says. But what I think it does say is that standard is way more diverse than people give it credit for. Most of the people that have been saying standard isn't any good or whatever are people that just haven't been playing standard. Almost everybody that has been or has been playing at their local stores will tell you like, oh yeah, I see this deck. I play this deck because my favorite. I even saw somebody early last week on Twitter saying they were surprised because they keep seeing all these people showing decks that they've qualified with in these standard RCQs and they haven't seen a similar deck yet. I was like, yeah, there's a lot of options. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly what we want. So yeah, this is this is a good time, man. It's just a matter of do people continue to adopt standard over the course of this year? You know, I think we're on the right track. I think this creates some conversation that gets people back in, interested. I think it shows people that, yeah, even if you want to play weird combo-y stuff, it's an option. Hell, there's a couple of different combos in standard right now. There's good control decks. There's good aggro decks. The mid rangey things are still around. Don't be wrong. There's a couple of cards that still annoy you. I mean, you know, Shieldred's still around. All the sweepers yeah. are still around. But they are beatable. And I think that's what's important. So, yeah, congratulations. You know, I mean, this is just a crazy, crazy deck. As soon as I heard about it from across the room, I was like, okay, I got to get this deck list and see what's up. And then I saw it and went, okay, the plan makes sense. But why are we playing 68 cards? You know, but it worked. So what the hell do I know? They're they're pocketing 15K right now. So they knew something the rest of us didn't. So congratulations there. But let's go ahead and hop into the soapbox. We had a couple of things to talk about. And, you know, I want to kind of continue on with the whole convention thing here. Man, there were some situations where I think people still don't understand how to interact with creators or I don't know, on some level, even celebrities, you know, because that's really, once you get to a certain level of creator, you kind of become a celebrity. Yeah. Right. Once you're over 500,000 subscribers, whatever, or followers, you kind of start hitting that celebrity status. And I saw two instances that bug me. The first was uh, for people that don't know in Chicago, they had, I guess we'll call it like a family area. So you can come over and they would teach kids how to build decks and they had like coloring pages and just like fun stuff for like just kids and families to do. And they invited over Jimmy and Josh from game nights to just come say hi, take a couple pictures, whatever. And they were like, Oh, absolutely. We'll do it. I mean, they're great dudes. And when they came over, a couple of people saw them and instantly tried to like bum rush this family area. Fortunately, several of the people there were just like, nope. And they basically built a force field around the area and said, like, that's not what they're here for, guys. They're doing a thing with the kids and the families, and that's it. You know, this isn't a meet and greet. This isn't a signing. That's not what what this is about. And then there was a situation later, or maybe it was slightly before that, because they were in different sections. But the professor had come over and was talking to uh, some of the other creator friends or whatever, just normal stuff. And if I remember right, and I, and this may not be totally accurate, but at some point he had stopped to either sign or whatever, something for somebody. And I think because he made the mistake of sitting at one of the tables while he did it, a couple of people saw him. And then, I, I mean, dude, I don't even know if it took two minutes for there to be like a hundred people in line. Like he just couldn't have time to himself. And it was crazy because even at the uh, during one of the lobby cons on Sunday night, I, I was telling him, I was like, dude, you got to get a handler, you know, or one of us can be a handler or something. But you need somebody to be the bad guy to tell people like, hey, not now, you know, so you can actually deal with a one on one situation or just have some time to yourself at the convention. Now, he's a really nice dude and he doesn't want to send people away or whatever. So he tries to take care of everybody. And I, I understand that. But. You're reaching the point that some of these, and I I don't think it's wrong to say celebrity, but for sure, the creators almost can't enjoy the space anymore. Which is the good and the bad, right? It means that there are a lot of people interested and a lot of people play magic and a lot of people know who you are. But at the same time, it's like they can't even wander around and just enjoy the show, which is bananas. 
right? But I mean, the trade off is you probably make a couple million dollars a year. So this this is the downside. That is what celebrity is, basically. Yeah, I. And the thing is, cosplayers figured this out a long time ago. Like, if you see cosplayers, most of them have somebody with them to try to make sure, you know, people around certain spots taking pictures or staying out the way or whatever. Like, it just became a thing. You have to. Yeah. And I think we may be at the point where we kind of have to start doing it with other We're personalities. Absolutely, like you said, the professor absolutely has to be, you know, I guess moved from, from place to place in that fashion it just yeah and he's it coming up on it, it a million subscribers know, it sucks that you can't enjoy the convention but that's just that that is a part of the price of it and yeah but i think again if i think if he has a handler he can yeah. but he i don't just his mentality. Like said, that's not his personality or his mentality. He, yeah. I get that. That's how I was raised, where somebody wants your autograph or your whatever, you know, like after every murder mystery show, we no matter how bad the show might have gone, no matter what else went on, we all line up and shake everybody's hand. And you know, now COVID happened and you kinda, oh God, now we don't but yeah, we're back to especially in Texas, we're back to lining up and Shaking everybody's hand, taking photos, doing whatever they want. It's funny. One of our murder mystery shows randomly it was a New Year's show. Jennifer Love Hewitt came to the show. Oh, nice. And of course, we all, you know, know how again that you want to be able to to enjoy the show and not act like uh, you know like you've seen a celebrity before. And uh, so, basically, uh, the people are trying to not, or, or really the troop are trying to not approach her because we, do, we don't understand at her level, but we do understand people want to talk to you while you're trying to do something else. And uh, so actually her her handler came out and said, hey, would you like to take photos? Like, well, hell yeah, we want to take photos of Jim. <laughs> we were just waiting for you to ask. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's a good example though, right? Like that's somebody that's at true celebrity status. Right. And even they have a handler to say like, hey, okay, now we're going to make time to take pictures. And I felt yeah. like she it seems like she probably would have been. I see why she enjoys it because again, nobody had approached her. She could have left and oh, not yeah. talked to anybody, but she realized, you know, they probably want to talk to me. So she said somebody said her handler, and she didn't have to do that. You know? you know what though? At least people were being respectful. Like, hey, she came just to see the show, like everybody else. Let's not bombard her. You know, so that's cool. But yeah, I don't. I don't know if it's a big problem yet overall, but it is something that as we continue and as some of these creators get bigger and bigger, I think it's going to become an issue, right? Because I was lucky to sit on a meet and greet panel with the commander advisory group. And we had a pretty good number of people come through, you know, pretty steady line up until like the very end. But then, you know, they're having to cap a lot of the lines at the events. You In know, this same era thing. of, you know, social media, it is, so it's infinitely easier for somebody that's good at what they do to become a celebrity. And, and like you said, when you hit certain numbers, there are people that are going to want to talk to you. And it's just, it, it's not like, you know, you, you don't have to go wait at the, uh, wait at the, the milkshake counter, like in the old 1950s, you know, and hope somebody sees how cute you are and makes you a star. No, we have, you, you can get on TikTok, any number of social medias or, you know, or write for any website. And if your content is interesting enough, people will find you. And before you know it, there's a lot of people who want to talk to you. Dude, you know, I and this is one of the things I'm submitting as feedback too. is I think we have to move from one hour signings to an hour and a half to two hour signings because a lot of the lines were capped, whether it's for Mark Rosewater, for Kibler and Olivia you know, for the professor when he was signing, like the lines were being capped fairly quick because you just knew we weren't going to get through more people than that within an hour. So we may need to even extend those times because more people are showing up to the shows. Like for, to put in perspective how crazy that show was, multiple artists had their lines capped in the first hour. That meant they were capping the line and whoever was at that point was going to be waiting in line for like six to seven hours in some cases to get to see the artists, but they weren't going to let anybody else in line because there's no need at that point, you know? So yeah, this dude, people just came from all over. It was, it was a crazy, crazy show top to bottom. So yeah, I, I, let me, I say all that though, to say this, if you're going to go to one of these shows, trust that the creators do want to 
have a positive experience with you. They do want to take a picture. They do want to sign some things. But if it's not a designated time, don't just rush over with an expectation, right? Don't feel bad if they say, hey, not right now, right? Or, hey, I'm taking some downtime. I'm just hanging out with some friends. But sure, I'll take a picture in a bit or whatever, right? Because there's still people trying to enjoy the show. Like, you like them because they also like magic and gaming and whatever, right? That's why you follow them. Let them enjoy it still somewhat, and then they will still take time to take care of you. Because almost everybody I talk to still ultimately wants to as many people as possible to leave happy. Yeah. You know, that's the goal. Let me say none of that applies to me. I'm literally there so you can soak in my my presence. (laughs) Hey, I feel you, dude. I feel you. But all right, let's see what you got. We are, uh, by the time you're hearing this, will be uh, Black History Month will be in the rearview window. And, you know, many years ago when History Channel realized it was going to stop being historic and start airing lots of episodes of Pawn Stars and American Pickers and whatnot, decided to develop the tagline, history is made every day to give them an excuse to act as if the Pawn Stars are historic. But, I mean, technically not untrue because they do take in a lot of historic artifacts. And then there's things that are interesting in there. And I want to say the same thing about, you know, Black History Month or all of these history months. You know, it's not just what happened 40 or 50 years ago. Think about how much black history has happened just in our little corner of the world in the past two or three years. Look at Daquan cranking out and do what seems like in infinite amount of content over the past uh, three, well, going on, what, four years? Four years, yeah. Yeah, four years. Think about, you know, uh, I mean, Lawrence Harmon and his essay, The Wizards I Know, that just kind of opened so many people's eyes and created so much change in in the space. Just so many, so many, and I said, this has just been in the past. (laughs) What what is, this is what episode, what what episode did we just say this was? (laughs) 229. Yeah, 220. Just really in the past three to four years, so many incredible things have happened that I don't think we, I, I think because we live through it <laughs> to some extent, we don't realize that history has been being made every day. But yeah, history has been made every day, seems like for the past several years. Think, think about <laughs> just 2020 and how everything was before 2020 that this the cards that shall not be named still existed and and wizards told us they had to exist you know for, for reasons <laughs> that weren't clear that weren't clear then even after it's still we're not clear why it took george floyd dying and lawrence calling them out for being racist and all the things that had to happen for those cards to get changed but all of that happened and it's still so many people doing so many incredible things doing just a few months ago where we talked about uh, tribal and how it didn't need to exist anymore. And good Lord, uh, that Reddit (laughs) showed up in my comments and, but you know, I, I didn't know they were coming, but I knew of course the people that are like, you know, tribal isn't bad because I knew those folks were coming. That we just, that's what people of color have had to deal with in the space since its inception. You know, to kind of add to what you're saying, one thing I do still find interesting is it's almost like we don't have more than one significant black creator in like each section of the space, right? We kind of have like one black cosplayer, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Like it's Orlando, the guy, the guy that does the ferry. Most recently, did a Professor Plum in Chicago, which was a fantastic outfit. I don't know if anybody saw that, but. Like, it's kind of him, right? He's the one that you know, right? Like, mm-hmm. I'm doing standard content on Arena. Like, I'm kind of the one that people know, yeah. right? We have, like, one or two that, like, just mostly do legacy, and that's what they're known for, right? Like, I just kind of... And it's weird like that, right? I mean, I guess technically we kind of have Joe Johnson that's known for a commander, and then we have, like, the, the one more mana guys, but... Mm-hmm. Even that is a huge gap on how many even, like, way more people know Joe than, than know the One More Man And we didn't, you know, so many, and it's a it, weird, there's so many people I didn't know until I started doing this. And, you know, we had to be, oh, yeah, look, other black people, so good to see you. And 
still people are in our comments all the time wondering why it's even a big deal to mention color. And to you who see people that look like you all over every gaming space every day, it's not a big deal. You're used to seeing the straight white male protagonist in everything. So it gets hard for you to understand why why people get emotional seeing Daquan, why so many people turned out to watch Black Panther, Shang-Chi, because these these things matter. If you don't... Dude, I'll, I'll tell you, in Chicago, there were a lot of those conversations, you know, where people came up as like, oh, man, it was cool when I started playing Magic and I saw there's another black guy playing or whatever, like... Well, I must have had that conversation like 25, 30 times. Seriously. Right? Like, and it's one of those things that like, I don't harp on it because like, we still just got to do business. We got to go, you know, you don't have time to stop and think about it every day. But then those situations happen and you're reminded that like, oh yeah, I guess there aren't a lot of us. You know, like you kind of get like, cause I know a few of them now. So yeah. you kind of, those are the ones you see, but you go, yeah, there's really not a lot of us. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a thing. But it is changing slowly, you know, but it's got to start somewhere. Exactly. That's why we that's why we do the things we do. And again, if I may borrow from History Channel, black history being made in magic every day. Yeah, now it is. (laughs) Yeah. Well, all right. Let's talk about some other things, because there's some pretty interesting things that came up this week. And uh, they're on very different ends of the spectrum. So. Why don't you take the lead here? All right, uh, IGN, which if you uh, take in uh, any gaming content at all, you're probably very familiar with, but uh, their workers have formed a union this month. And there have been a couple of other gaming sites or outlets that have formed, they're in the process of doing that, but IGN, I think, is going to be the biggest one so far, and apparently their employers have recognized their union, (laughs) realized this is happening, 87%. 87%. Uh, well, this is uh, this this particular piece is a couple of weeks old, but as of as of about two weeks ago, 87% of the people that are eligible to join the group have signed union cards. And it's just a thing that there, there are so many people that want to get into games journalism. And for decades, companies have taken, it's not just games journalism or any form of, ju- there are so many people, especially now, that need a job. And it's the employer gets to take advantage of the fact that, hey, people need to work, especially in journalism. People have been willing to do it for free or damn near free for so long that it's been an employer's market. There, If, if you go on any of the sites that list games journalism jobs, you will see some of them Better than half of the jobs either don't pay anything or pay, you know, like penny per pay per thousand views or some nonsense like that to where you you would be better off, you know, flipping burgers really than than writing for those sites. But again, because it is so hard to get in, people end up taking those jobs. So I'm excited to see IGN's workers doing this. I'm excited to see that IGN, at least for the time being, is working with them. And understanding that that needs to happen. Now, obviously, they're going to have, as unions and workers, they're going to have plenty of disagreements. They're going to have some back and forth. That's why unions exist. Arbitration is nobody is going to get everything that they want ever. (laughs) But if we all get to the table and sit down and realize, hey, things need to change, hopefully everybody gets at least some of what they want. One of the best quotes I ever heard is a good negotiation is when both sides leave slightly uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, you nobody got everything, but you gave up a little, and both sides had to walk away as happy as they can be. Right. You know? One of my editors used to say that after you've uh, covered a kind of a controversial event, if both sides are ticked off at you, that probably means you did a good job. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> if, 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 if one side is a little too happy with you, you probably didn't cover it completely fairly. But yeah, yeah I can say, that's to, that's actually probably accurate. I, I'm happy to say I have have left a lot of events where I felt like both sides were really ticked off at me for whatever that's worth. Yeah, you know, I as long as the union is doing their part to really, really, truly fight on behalf of the employees, you know, I think more places could use them just to make sure that you're getting a fair shake, like a minimum pay. 
you know, health benefits, time off, whatever the case may be. Because I'm with you. You know, even in the writing gigs I've had over the years, there's been everything from just flat fees for the whole article to so many cents per word yeah. to, I mean, like every variation in between. It's right? a there's wild no, west. no consistency. To, to do freelance writing. So if this... If this helps create what hopefully is an industry standard and some, it's got to be somebody like IGN that does something like that to, to show other people how, that, first of all, that financially there is a way to do it. Obviously, the smaller your operation, the harder it is. But still, you know, if, if you want your workers to actually go to bat for you and do good work, they got to be able to, you know, make a living. <laughs> Maybe have some insurance, just the basic things that, that human beings need to exist. <laughs> you know, yeah, because really, if it wasn't IGN, it probably would have had to have been like Kotaku, maybe. Yeah. Probably. Like, because there's not that many sites that are that big, you yeah. know, that employ that many people that you could justify the union, probably. Exactly. And At least just, in gaming. You know. Yeah. Yeah, just even where even them having a union becomes a story that all the other sites in gaming end up covering. It lets people know, hey, things are things are changing, and that's hopefully is going to change for the better. Because as I said, it's been like you said, I've worked for everything from per piece to hey, we'll send you a video game, you know. And again, when especially now games are seventy dollars, yeah, okay, yeah, I, I will take that, and then I'll especially since I also do YouTube, I'll try to see what other content i can create from that game sometimes it's, but it's dude just, i'm pretty sure for one of them i got some booster packs and a t-shirt right like for real and now admittedly this is like oh two i think sometime around then but still you know that that's the level that some stuff is at but that tells you you know back then i was like okay i mean you're just giving me an opportunity to write i guess so yeah but one of the things i learned quickly between writing for these websites and magazines and stuff is now I couldn't write for free because I had to justify the time. Exactly. You know, at some point, once you get paid a couple of times, like, well, okay, yeah. who am I going to give favored time to? The one that may or may not pay some significant or the one exactly. that actually is a real paycheck, right? I had a I had another comedian tell me one time, once you have been paid, <laughs> that means you're a professional comedian. You don't do it for free anymore. <laughs> you know, it's, you, you have crossed the threshold. Because, <laughs> yeah, there are some people that, that will want unfortunately never get their craft to the point where they get paid but once you have proven somebody you're worth somebody paid yeah you don't you don't step back and cross the line there's too many people in every industry get to get you do it for exposure like can i pay rent with exposure yeah at that can point I, the only time you do anything for free is if you just are showing up out of the blue to just work on some material that's or, about it. Yeah. Or, you know, <laughs> if it's a, like there, there's a charity event that we yeah, do. Yeah, charity is always different. Now, now by yeah. the way, we still get paid, but it may not necessarily be what yeah. I would get paid for doing, you know, a, a bigger venue or something. Because, hey, I'm trying to, you know, it's a cause I also believe in. It's an adult literacy center. And, I, that's, again, as the son of an English teacher, I'd be in trouble if I, you know, didn't, <laughs> didn't do True. a fundraiser for the True. adult literacy, literacy center. As I, as I, as I mispronounce literacy. It's all right. I did have people point out to me that they enjoyed the way you say sorcery. <laughs> I, I swear I said sorcery. <laughs> I, that's what I think. Okay, so this next bit, we talked about this. I feel like it was like a year and a half ago because there was a Kickstarter they were doing to try to get this going. And WWE superstar... Big E, Big E Langston, because they, they lost his last name at some point. He just became Big E yeah. for some reason. But Big E has been working with a studio, an animation studio, to create a series of cartoons to teach people about things that we don't talk about anymore or don't talk about in schools for sure. And it's almost like a modernized version of Schoolhouse Rock or the after school specials we grew up with or whatever. Just animated, right? Yep. And they finally got the first one about Ruby Bridges done. And the trailer's on YouTube. So you can look up just Big E Ruby Bridges trailer. It'll, it'll come up. But it looks pretty sweet. I The yeah. animation style is very much a throwback style. But it's much brighter, colorful. It's going to be... I don't know if I want to say intense. Because I don't think that's the right word. 
but <clears throat> very well, like emotional. You said, it's stuff that sadly we don't learn about in school very often, especially in places. I mean, now even you know, just even putting something in a textbook requires a committee and. I feel like we used to be able to agree on what was historic and we were all in agreement that the integration of schools was a big deal because again, knowledge is knowledge is power. And I just watched this great special we're talking about black history Month things. So it's a great special on Frederick Douglass and he realized when he when he when his uh slave masters told somebody they were teaching him to read, don't teach him to read. If you give him letters, he won't be worth being a slave anymore. And that's when the light went off. And Frederick does it. If master doesn't want me to read, that's good. That's how I know I yep. need to be read because I don't want to be a slave anymore. So I want to not be fit. And so what he did was he went out and he would, there was this lady in the neighborhood that made really good biscuits and he would, he would get extra biscuits and he would go to the school and he would trade biscuits for, for words. Interesting. <laughs> That's how he just can you imagine that? And now we have people that you know don't want to read, don't want to go but dude, to school. Here's here's I an mean. interesting thing, right? Because I had shared this chart not long ago, kind of showing like the timeline of the country and like when there was slavery, when you know Jim Crow hit and all that. And just to kind of put in perspective, like, hey, that wasn't that long ago. Right? No. Even even Ruby Bridges, who this cartoon, this first episode is based around. She's barely old enough to collect Social Security. Right. You know what I mean? Like, she's somebody's grandma still walking the planet. Mm -hmm. Right. And I don't think people understand that. Like, this same woman was, I mean, basically, there was a mob trying to keep her from going to school. You and know, sadly, some, school. Of the people that, some of the people that don't want to put that in the history books sadly understand all too well. Well, I, I had this conversation. And don't want to answer questions about how racist that's, they that's were. That's exactly it. I remember having this conversation, but I said, well, why don't we or whatever? And I said, well, if you think about it, it's not that long ago, right? If we're saying it's Ruby Bridges is just now old enough to yeah. be a grandparent, you know, some of these other people are still grandparents walking the planet. Yep. We just they don't want to have those where, conversations, right? They don't want to talk about how they used yeah. to not want to drink from the same water fountain as somebody. Right, that they didn't want to hire somebody because of the color of their skin. Right, that they really couldn't eat at the same in restaurant. Arkansas, and and they somebody picked Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones out of the photo, and he yeah. had to try to explain. You know, yeah, my, my coach told me not to go, but I went down there anyway, and I shouldn't have. Yeah, and you... yeah. I mean, and don't be wrong, people can change and whatever. Like, cool, I get it, but I think it makes a lot of people uncomfortable to have mm -hmm. those conversations, and if they can avoid it. They're going to push it away as long as they can to not have to have those talks. People because, can change, but you know, if you want, like in Jerry Jones case, my money or in a politician's case, my vote, I'm going to need to ask you some questions so that I'm comfortable. Oh, sure. Feeling that you have changed. But you like know, when you, imagine somebody's kid saying, or grandkid saying, Hey, you know, when they watch this cartoon and I seem like, well, how did you feel about that? Cause you yeah. went to school at that time or mm -hmm. whatever. Right. That's going to be a tough conversation. It, it's just going to be, I mean, there's right. no way around it. Did you go to, to that rally grandpa? And if so, which side were you on? And these are uncomfortable questions. Yeah. So I, I just think it's cool. Cause it was a big Kickstarter. You know, it, it took a while for them to get, I mean, admittedly, some of that was the studio coming out of the pandemic and, you know, there was a lot of that to work through and Biggie's been injured. So he's been having a rehab from a neck injury and everything else, but they apparently found time to make it happen. So it's cool. Uh, I don't think it said when it goes officially live. That's the only thing I don't have. Uh, let's see. Now I didn't have an official date, but at least the, it's complete. And they do have the full trailer for it. So it's a minute long trailer if you want to check it out. Actually, it's about 40 seconds, really. But yeah, really cool that that's the thing. Because like I said, it's one of those things we talked about. And you never know when those projects are going to actually get done or if they're ever going to be completed. So it's pretty cool to, to see one of those come together. Definitely. Let's talk about a couple of other things here, though. There was an interesting Reddit post that came up. And it was for an employee of Card Kingdom that kind of just went off on 
working conditions, how their PTO works, you know, overtime or not, <clears throat> you know, moving to the new facility. They kind of covered a lot of different things. Now, I will say this before I even read the Card Kingdom thing, because Card Kingdom put a full rebuttal on their page and, you know, explained a lot, to be fair. They were they were probably more transparent than I anticipated them to be, to, to be honest with you. But we already know capitalism sucks. I mean, I think we all agree on that part. So you don't have to make up things to make us be mad at your company, right? You could just tell us some basic stuff and we would just be like, yeah, that tracks. But my problem was when I read it, it, it was obvious the person didn't understand the PTO policy they have. And then part of what they said also was, that like Card Kingdom only gave employees a couple of weeks to decide if they were going to move to the new facility with them or not. And I knew that wasn't correct because one, I knew they were moving, I swear, like five, six months ago. So employees had to have found out before I found out. Well, I mean, right? did they tell? Because I've, I mean, I've heard them being accused of not telling everybody things at the same Because to some extent, there's like, obviously the management is going to know, but to say before the person that just, Works the front door. I don't know. I found out from somebody on the floor. So I'm like, that's why I'm like, somebody knew, other employees knew. So like, whatever. But it also doesn't make sense anyway, because a company's not going to just tell people like a couple weeks out, because they would, even if you can't get that many people to move on short notice or whatever, right? They would have just lost, let's say, even a third of their employees. Their production goes in the tank and they just lose a crap ton of money when they move. So that that doesn't make a lot of sense. So I was pretty certain that that wasn't the case. And even on their website, when they in their rebuttal, they said they gave, I think they started, said they started talking about it like eight months ago or whatever. And they had some type of package. So if people did want to move to help them out with stuff or whatever. So, eh. And the PTO thing, I, to be fair, Car Kingdom is pretty generous with PTO. They give people three weeks, like 15 days. And I think at the end of the first year, you get an additional four days. So, yeah, your your sick time can, but it's just one pool of hours. Like you just pick and choose whatever days you want. I think the person writing it assumed that, like, well, if I get sick, I I shouldn't have to use PTO or whatever. But it's like every company just has a different policy. Some actually have sick time and PTO, which makes no sense because they operate the exact same way. And if you're out of one, you just pull from the other one anyway, so it doesn't matter. But most places just have PTO, and then if you're sick or whatever, you just call in and it comes out of your PTO hours. But yeah, it, it it just felt weird, man. Because like, you don't want to side with the company against a person. Like, there's no need. The company's doing all right. Like, you don't you don't need to side with the company. But when you come in saying things like that, that don't make sense or obviously aren't well researched, then it makes people just side with the company. And it's just because now now you just look like an angry employee that just didn't understand policies. But if you wanted to, you know, do just a little bit of further research, Car King has been unfi- under fire going oh, back sure. a couple of years. So it's but not that's, like... That's what I'm saying. Like, you could have said almost anything else and we'd have just been like, yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we, you, you had everybody on your side. It wouldn't have been a problem. Like, we know they've had... That, that's one of the reasons they ended up with the union. You know what I mean? Like, so, yeah. we know so that's person. Thing. So, so in this case, incorrect about some things sounds like, but yeah, Card Kingdom does appear to suck a little bit. Now, <laughs> so that being said, what, what been I will be fair and say that warehouse jobs in general for a lot of people are not great. I mean, it, it's just the nature of the jobs. You know, I think one of the things they were upset about is like, well, you know, you felt expendable because they're constantly replacing people and there's turnover. It's like, yeah, the level one warehouse jobs everywhere have a lot of turnover. Most people get those jobs as temp jobs or, you know, holdover jobs till they find the next thing they're doing. That's every, I don't matter if it's Amazon, if it's star city, if it's card kingdoms, wherever. I mean, that's just the way it is. So that part, I was like, yeah, there's turnover. Now where I would be concerned is if management up has a lot of turnover, then you start going like, Oh, well, why do people not want to stay with this company long-term? Right. Like then that starts to become a real problem. But yeah, the level one jobs, I mean, there's only so much room to advance in every company and everybody knows that. So like once you've done what you can do, it's just like, okay, well, I'll just move on to the next thing. But yeah, it was interesting. 
kind of the conversation that came around it because some people were talking about it on Reddit, some people were talking about it on Facebook. I didn't see much of it on Twitter, surprisingly. It was really the other two spots that I saw most discussion on this. But people were having mostly balanced conversations, which is yeah. weird. You know, like that almost doesn't happen. But there were people saying, yeah, you know, people need better conditions, whatever, like totally agree. But there were also people saying, yeah, but the person obviously doesn't understand a lot of stuff. And, you know, like me, a lot of people were surprised how much clarity that Card Kingdom was willing to put in their statement. Yeah. Because they didn't have to say all that. And well, I, I, they realize, you know, they were they were around for all the negative PR they've gotten over the past couple of years. So they've learned kind of how to respond to this stuff now. And sometimes, again, that's why you are good. Companies got to go through this. So they understand how not to continue stepping, stepping on that same rake and hitting themselves in the face. So they now, clearly I will say this. has learned a little bit. If they are doing stuff in accordance with the union and you don't like it, go yell at your union. Right. That's the whole reason you got them. Right. Don't be mad at the company. If they're saying, look, your union asked for these things. We gave you all these things. If that ain't good enough, then go talk to your union. <laughs> like, that's what they're there for. That's literally the reason they exist. So so go interact with them. But bringing it back around to uh, the convention for MagicCon. I wish I would have saved the the post, but there was a person who has some autistic tendencies, it sounds like, kind of distracted by auditory stuff and whatever. And they were talking about how it was difficult for them to play the competitive events because of where they were situated in the hall and you were still getting a lot of noise from other things. You know, other people being excited about things in lines or being excited for stuff on the main stage or whatever the case may be. And I... I kind of get that, you know, like, especially if you're one of those players, like we're, we're talking about earlier, you know, you paid a hundred dollars to play in the right. 75k or whatever. You kind of want to be able to focus as well as you can. Yeah. Right. That's tough. But I started thinking like, you know, as well as I do playing events at conventions is a crap shoot anyway. <laughs> like there's always events starting late product has to be brought from across the hall You've got judges trying to manage multiple events at one time. You, you've got players showing up to the wrong spot so the events get held up or whatever. Constant problems. Like, I'm at the point that I don't play organized events ever at conventions anymore unless it's a very specific thing that I am willing to take the gamble for. But I know what it's like, right? There's just tons of people walking around. There's distractions everywhere. That's part of being at a convention. But to that end, the room at the very least, even if you don't get a whole separate space, should have at least been organized to where the competitive stuff is further from the largest noise making things. Definitely. That's definitely a thing that should happen. Yeah, whatever, whatever that is, because really, like, you know, if the commander free play tables were in that section. All right, whatever. It's a bunch of casual games. Nobody really cares. It's fine. But if people are trying to compete for literally thousands of dollars, we should at least make some concession to at least where they sit in the room to make it less noisy. I mean, it's a convention hall. There will be noise. But make it less so at the very least. If you don't, because I kind of get not paying for a whole separate room or whatever. Because, man, at these big convention centers, extra rooms are literally like, for the size you need, might be 10K. You know what I mean? It's, it's another big chunk of change. But we could we could make it a little better for people, for sure. I mean, because I'll ask you this. Like, when was the last time you played any events at conventions? And were they noisy or distracting or whatever? The, the, the last couple were not because they, I mean, they were kind of like the death throes of those particular games. Like, it was Raw Deal was one and Versus was another. So it just happened. There were only eight to ten people in the events in most cases. So yeah, we had, and I, and I don't know who footed the bill for. Well, I'm assuming yeah, I guess I think I think the raw deal was kind of like just really literally a corner, and we had even more space than we needed, if I remember correctly. Well, how those you could fit in any breakout room with that many people. Yeah, and then uh, the, the versus one was kind of like the uh, I guess it really was kind of the death throes of versus. So I think they had probably even expected a few more people than what they got. So it really was cavernous. You know? 
Well, see, yeah, that's a whole different story, I guess. If you're playing a dying game, there's going to be way more extra <laughs> seats. So you don't even got to worry about it. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's tough, you know, because I think we have to so almost start rethinking what Magic Cons can even be or look like. Because the attendance was nuts. I would not be surprised if we hear the final number for Chicago was somewhere between twelve and 14,000. Which... Doesn't sound insane when you you know about like seventy thousand at Gen Con or like a hundred thousand at, at Comic Con or whatever, but for a very specific game, and for February in Chicago, <laughs> yeah, right, say. like that's pretty crazy. But I'll even tell you, like I even did an impromptu like Ravnica trivia thing, just because I was like, okay, let's come up with some prizes, give some away, let's make some quick little content. And even that was like people going, oh, you're doing trivia? And then before you know it, I have a line of people waiting. Like it literally went from nobody there to a line in like five, ten minutes. You know, to the point that uh, Deanna, the lady's in charge of the ambassador program, was just bringing out more prizes for me to just give away. She was like, look, I got this. You can give them. I got this. You know, like, all right, cool. You know, but even that was like people were just looking for things to do and saying that because there's so many bodies just everywhere. So we kind of have to start re-envisioning how big a magic con can be because i had the real thought dude like chicago was that big what is vegas going to look like in october because everybody wants to go to vegas every time like could that be a 15 17 000 attended event like possibly which is crazy to say for magic but like that might be real It'll, it'll outdraw the las vegas a's whenever they become a thing well, yeah, that's actually sad, but funny. But yeah, I mean, that, that means we could be progressively bigger every year at these events. And do, And I've heard, apparently, they just announced the stuff for Amsterdam a couple weeks ago, and a bunch of the packages are already selling out. Yeah. Like, the, you know, part of the conversation, too, is we sit here and say, Withers is doing all this, and they're killing the game and whatever. I'm like, bruh, I don't, I don't know what they're killing. Because, like, you can't be selling out all these events and at the end of the year, say you're making, whatever, $1.5 billion or whatever, and the game just be dying. Like Those things don't add up. I think it's uh, a lot of people that are saying like, that it's dying. It's not even just that it's dying. It's <laughs> that the game, the way that, like, for example, if you hate Universes Beyond, the game's on life support for you because two, two sets out of six are going to be in universes beyond whatever sets would have gone, whatever magic related things would have gone in those holes, maybe dead. There are certain planes we'll probably never return to again. Cause we're going to be doing two universes beyond sets for the foreseeable future. And then what if we have, you know, like, uh, well, I mean, Karloff Manor, we're never going there again in all likelihood. <laughs> you know, but you know, I, I think what you said is very accurate. I think for, the old guard things are changing yeah and we may not like the way those things are changing but every creator i spoke to said there was tons of people that were at that commission that had started playing within the last year or two and that's that, that's what universe is beyond is supposed to be doing yeah dude literally i talked to two dudes they and not only that okay first off they drove 12 hours they'd only been playing for two months like, which is already crazy. Like, you decided yeah. this magic's cool. We're going to go see what this magic con is. They don't know anybody or anything. They bought the maximum VIP package, stayed at a nice hotel nearby. Like, they they were all in, right? They knew so little. Like, they were going to all the creators and literally just doing, like, what is it that you do? And then they were looking people up in real time and, like, following people or whatever because they didn't know anything, right? Yeah. But they were so excited about the new products and the game and whatever that they were willing to spend literally thousands of dollars, drive 12 hours, and just come see what it was all about, right? And that's why I'm looking at it and saying, okay, it may not be good for us or the way we're used to things being. But when you looked around the room, those are people that don't know it to ever be any other way, right? If they started playing two years ago or three years ago, it's always been like this. Yeah. They don't know, like, okay, cool. There's whatever, eight sets a year or whatever. Okay. They just shrug their shoulders because they don't know any better. Right. You know, like we remember a time where there was just four, right? Yeah. But, but they don't, you know, like, 
we remember a time before Universe is Beyond. And somebody like that d- does it and, and probably never will know such a time again if things go as they're going. Oh, yeah. And they don't even flinch about it. They're excited for all the new products. Right? They, as far as they're concerned, this is just the the magic equivalent of Fortnite or whatever. You know, like, they don't, they don't care. And I think that's the hard part for people to accept is, like, these new players that are, I don't know where they're coming from. They're coming from everywhere. But they don't know things to be any different. They're just hopping in, buying a thing, going and playing kitchen table with their friends, their cousins, their significant others, whatever, and just having a good time with it. And if that sells cards, then great. That's what we're just going to keep doing. But the only thing we can do is if you don't like it, don't buy it. You got to speak with your wallets. Well, we said before, if you're going to sit here and complain, but keep handing over $20 bills while you complain, then your complaints going to fall on deaf ears. You know, you even now I see people online complaining on Twitter, but then they're like, oh, did you see that new Eldrazi deck? Like, you know, like immediately, like when it goes live. So it's like you were mad up until the thing you like came out. All of a sudden you ain't, you ain't even mad no more. Right. Like, so it's a big, big bit of silliness for sure. But the conventions are definitely changing. The people attending are changing. Lots of families coming through. We saw saw that a bunch. So I just think like what they can be and how big they can be. I mean, you know, maybe we start reimagining things. We start adding extra stuff. Hell, we we did a little uh, create Clash of the Creators, which was not Family Feud, but we did that. And people loved it. So they're like, okay, well, we might start doing that at every convention, and then maybe add some other game show type games because there's a lot of downtime on the main stage. We can fill it with other stuff, especially when you have that many bodies. You're like, okay, you need to just keep finding stuff for people to do so the bodies are moving and not just crowding spots or whatever. But everybody, dude, I didn't even get to go see any of the panels. And everybody I know who did one, they said the panels were half to max full, pretty much all of them. Like, that's something that wasn't even happening on the first couple of times we did them. Now they're saying like, yeah, people are interested in everything because there's so many people going. So we're just in in a different era of magic at this point. I don't think people, like, until you go and see it and you talk to all the new players and whatever it's kind of hard to grasp how different this current era of magic is as far as who's buying it, the behaviors, the, the buying tendencies, whatever, but it's definitely different than it was 10 years ago. And I don't think it's necessarily bad. It's just different, you know, and that's, that's a hard conversation. I think it, 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 it wasn't the lifespan of somebody playing magic always around three to four years. It's like five to seven years. Okay. But even then, that you know, you definitely would have went through a couple of cycles in the last decade. Yeah. You know, so and that makes sense, too. But anyway, let's wrap things up with the dinner table here. And this is something we meant to talk about last week, but we just ran out of time. But it's, but it's an interesting conversation because there were, was a player who brought up, and, and I'm not going to go look it up and throw people's names out there because I don't think this is one of those things where that's necessary. But there was a player who had mentioned they talked to Star City, because Star City will be running the RCQ soon, or the the RCs, the regional championships. And they were trying to defer their qualification from Texas, Dallas, to the next one. And they told him, no, they're not going to let them, whatever. And their concern was because they are part of the Alphabet community, and their concern was, hey, I know how politics are down there and I'm not sure I necessarily want to go to Texas. And that's fair. I mean, I get it. If you're part of that community, I mean, you know as I do, I mean, you still live there. I lived there for a long time. Like it's, there's some messed up people when it comes to that, that subject. Now, I will say, not quite as bad as Florida these days, but still bad. (laughs) But it also depends on what part of the state you go to. There are parts that are going to be way better than anything you would experience in, in you know, Florida, per se. And then there are places going to be worse than. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think that was the biggest thing because it started a conversation where several people who were part of that community said, No, it's fine. I've been to a lot of events already in Dallas. Hell, we had DreamHack in Dallas uh, each of the last couple of years or whatever. And that, that was fine. Right. And we do the charity event, and I'll be down there in a couple of weeks. You know, and that's fine. So if you're in the major hubs, you know, Dallas, Austin, Houston, 
to mo for the most part, San Antonio, you're probably going to be okay. The problem is when you start talking about, hey, let's go to this barbecue joint that's in this small town out, out east or whatever. You're like, or, nah, or even before then, because nah. you're not just going to. Because you're not just going to teleport from whatever state you live in to Dallas. You got to go through the airport. Sure, sure. You, you have to get transported to wherever the and, and these events are very rarely in you know, quote unquote Dallas. They're often in Arlington, Fort Worth, some suburb of Dallas. Especially if you're from out of town, you don't know because like let's say go ahead from Dallas to Fort Worth, you can easily pass through White Settlement, and that ain't a place. Just by it being called White Settlement, I try not to get caught there very often. Yeah, you know? but there I, have been times when I've, dude. Even when I go back, I just Uber from or or get the rental car from the airport to wherever the event is, and I'm just usually at the event center for ten hours. And even you and Uber, you know, Uber has made us completely comfortable with getting in a car with a complete stranger. Oh sure, not that a, not that a taxi driver wasn't a stranger but at least they had a license you could look at where somebody somewhere you feel like has done at least a little bit of vetting to make sure they're not a serial killer uber you have no idea Dude, who that person it's funny you say it like there have been a couple places where i right? particularly took a taxi to like for real <laughs> like that's that's legit just i'm like at least this is going to be safer i don't care if it does cost five dollars more or whatever yeah you know it's fine but yeah, and again, a, we're we're dudes. <laughs> imagine, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, imagine a woman being in that same situation. You have to be way more careful. Not to say that I can't get shot, knocked out, or what have you. Because while I while I may be a, a heavy dude, don't let it, don't be convinced that I can fight. That's not a thing. <laughs> you know, but it but it does raise those interesting bits of conversation of the things people think about. You know, again, yeah. The event in Dallas is probably going to be safe, you know, but still, I get why that person had that concern, right? Because if you don't know, and you've seen all the political stuff going on and whatever, like, there's reason to be concerned. Like, you know, like we're saying, if you ain't never been to Florida, if you ain't never been to Indiana, if you whatever, like, I get it. Now, again, if you go to Indiana, you're going to be in Indianapolis, you're going to be there for Gen Con, probably fine. Like, hell, even the bikers now are comfortable with all the nerds that come into town. Like, they, you know, whatever. But Again, I ain't going anywhere outside go, of Indianapolis. <laughs> whatever state you go to, the majority of people are not going to bother you. But all it takes is all it takes is one psychopath. Oh, sure. You end up injured, dead, kidnapped. Because, okay, yeah, we're talking about Dallas. I, every year in Dallas, no less than, I'm going to say, probably six or seven transgender people get killed simply for being transgender. And sure. again, Dallas is considered to be one of the more, at least parts of the one of the more progressive locate. Dallas County, for example, is extremely blue politically, but still that happens every year. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And if, but it, and but if you're one of thinking, those seven or like one of those seven many, or eight people. Like how many states would we not run events in based on politics? And that's the thing that that's the calculus that, that Wizards is not ever going to do. Oh, of course not. That's of just, course, not. a lot of companies won't, you know. Yeah. But I thought about that. Like, there's a lot of states that if we kind of held to that, we just wouldn't put stuff there ever. 50 percent of the country, you know, yeah. goes red in, in your average election. Which is kind of crazy to think about. But like, there's a bunch of you'd be like, yeah, I don't know if we need to put an event like, I don't know, Nebraska or whatever. You know what I mean? Like. Like, and the and, only the only time companies take a stance is when somebody has just got a legal policy because it's obviously like for like for example I think where Augusta National was just not letting black people into the course of PGA Tour like hey come on it's I forget what well, year dude, it was people it's, forget back when Mike Pence was still governor of Indiana they had that situation where they tried to put all these like anti gay things in place yeah and then, like. The NCAA was like, cool, that no more Big Ten championship anything in the state of Indiana. Right. And like Gen Con and its crew and like all them, they were thinking, okay, cool, then we'll just move our convention somewhere else. And then, you know, it was like six or seven big events and they kind of went, whoa, hold up, hold up, hold up. That's yeah. going to cost us like $5 billion in state revenue. And, un it's like, and unfortunately, there just isn't probably going to be any magic qualifier that has that kind of pull, unfortunately. No, no. I mean, you know, you're you're good for maybe a million, maybe two. Yeah. 
you know, like people buying hotels and rental yep. cars and whatever. Like you, you probably, I say that you probably worth up to about 10 million potentially, but that's not a billion. You know what I mean? Like that, that's right. a whole different ball game. And these aren't going to be on television like the PGA oh, Tour yeah. would yeah. or Final Four or all the things you just mentioned. So it's tough. It's tough. But yeah, it was one of those things that it was good to see the conversation from different people in that same community, like, you know, working it out or whatever. But I didn't think it was unreal that the person had that concern. Because like, again, if you don't know, you'd rather be safe than sorry, really. And unfortunately, they're just neither with her. I think it's, is it Star City that's running these particular qualifiers? Yeah, starting starting with the Dallas one, I believe Star City will be in yeah. charge. They are just not going to go through, like you said, and pick this state, that state, this state, that state, and then say that these states aren't going to be cool because they're just it, it, it's political calculus. It's just political and financial calculus. It is basically never going to happen. And then for the states, you know, they kind of go back. I guess the, the purple states, if you will. If they elect a Democratic governor, do we revisit the pot? They're sure. Neither but, of but here's another thing too: like to Star City themselves are in Virginia. Yeah, you know, like there should Star City never get to run an event in Virginia, their backyard, because they're in Roanoke, but they've run events, I believe, in Roanoke and in Richmond. You know, but and Richmond was cool. I had a problem with it. I went one time a couple of years ago for a command fest. People were friendly. It was cool, but again. It's a fairly major city in that state, right? Yeah. Like, I wasn't adventuring nowhere, but, but you know, the city was cool. <laughs> and I think that's kind of the case with a lot of places. And that's yeah. the good thing is most of these events do happen in the major cities most of the time, which help a lot with the problems, fortunately. That's why we have these conversations, because, again, if you, you know, or if, if you aren't, if you don't check other on any of those boxes, these are conversations you have probably never had to have before in your life. You That's have true. not had to worry about it, again, unless now you can, anybody can get mugged for, you know, their possessions on their way to anywhere, but in terms of being attacked just because, of your skin color or your sexual persuasion or anything like that. These are things that a lot of people, have, well, let's face it, the the majority of people that play magic have not had to worry about. Yeah, that's absolutely true. But all right, brother, why don't you everybody they can find you on the social media machines? All right. I am Brian Sonic on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me everywhere at Power Dragon, P-O-W-R-D-R-A-G-N. And I've got a lot of content coming from Chicago. I think I have like the trivia stuff's going to be up, uh, a whole vlog from the weekend. So I just got to find time to get it all done. But keep an eye on the YouTube channel. As always, wherever you are watching or listening, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. And please remember to take care of yourselves and your family. Remember to be awesome. And most importantly, be awesome to each other. <laughs>